So many times in our lives, God is trying to shift us in the new directions and take us down new paths. God is shifting things in our faith walks, our spiritual journeys, our relationships, our finances, our communities, our ministries. But in order for the shift to take place, our faith has to poise us in the position where we submit to the will of God and become obedient to his word for our lives. And we say, God, I might not see the road that lies ahead, but I trust you for wherever you're taking me. And I trust that you know the plans you have for me. See, when the shift takes place, your outlook on life, your perspective changes. You don't walk like you used to walk. You don't talk like you used to talk. Your actions, your interactions, your reactions change. The things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. The things of your past that had control over you no longer have any power because you're forgetting those things that were behind you and you're now pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. When the shift takes place, the things that are weighing you down in your life, you can set them aside and move forward forward in Christ when the shift takes place your faith frees you to fully trust in God and you can realize that faith really is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen and that's when the shift begins good morning again so um we started off this new year with this thought process that, that it's time to shift into something new, it's time to shift into something different, and this is one of those moments in life where we get a chance to shift and everybody's okay with it, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, just, you just can't pull like a day out of like March and say, hey, I'm going to change. But you can make a change at the beginning of the year and people will go along with it. You know, this is one of those moments. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago there are several moments in, in life that happen when you can make a change and you can make a significant shift in your life and people will go along with it. Like when you graduate, you know, you can say, well, now that was then, this is now, I'm moving into this new place in my life, I've shifted into something different and people will be like, okay, we're behind you. Or when you get married, right? You're married, you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to be this person now and everybody's going to go along with that or at least most of us think that that's what's going to happen when we get married. And some people marry us hoping Anyway, that's this whole nother sermon series right there I just thought about this. <laughs> anyway, or, or like when children come in, or we, when we change a job, or some life significant moment happens, and we think, okay, now it's time for me to change. It's, it might be time to change my diet. It's time to change my, the way I handle life and living, the way I change my finances and affect how I, I approach life, or... Maybe it's time to change my spiritual direction. And so we decided to take a moment to talk at the beginning of this year what shift looks like for us individually and to look at the shift that's happening for us as a church. Individually, we talked the first couple of weekends in January here, we talked about what the shift looks like for each one of us. And we talked about stepping into a deeper, more profound, more purposeful spiritual journey. We talked about daily devotional life and daily prayer and missional life and tithing and worship and the things that are important. And if we're going to move forward, there's some, just some significant things we need to do to move forward in our spiritual journey. There are things we can do to elevate and move the needle and move the dial just a little bit closer to what it looks like to look like Jesus. And it's going to take some purposeful things in our lives. And these are not just you know New Year's resolutions. These are a shift in how we look at life and how we handle our day and how we look at our spiritual and devotional life. And so we talked about that the first week. The second week we talked about where all this comes from and ultimately the Bible says that we're supposed to be people who are living a right life. That it comes from deep within our hearts. If we're going to live a right life, if we're going to do this, if we're going to make the shift, it's got to happen first in our hearts. Because in our minds, our minds can make shifts, and those are called New Year's resolutions, but they usually don't last. I don't know about you. I have thought that I would change, right? I have made thoughts thinking, I want to change, I want to do this, I'm going to think of my way through this, right? I might mark things down in the calendar, I might mentally make myself think that I can change, but the reality for most of us is if we wanted to be somebody different, we'd have done it already. If it just took our mental processes. I mean, I don't want to step on your toes because I just stepped on mine. But if I wanted to be something different, I would have been something different already if it were up to my mental state. So it's got to be something different. It's got to make the 18-inch drop to my heart. 
And the only way that's going to happen is if I bring Jesus into there and have him start transforming my heart from the inside because whatever happens on the outside needs to be a response to what's going on on the inside. So we talked about that in the second week. In the third week, we said, that, so then if, if we're going to be those kinds of people, then what are the things we're going to focus in on? The first thing we said we're going to focus in on is we're going to make family one of the first priorities for us, and that's the place we're going to start living this out. We're going to start living it out in our families. And we said that's one of the toughest places to live this out, isn't it? Because our families know us so well. Like, they know when we're faking it, right? <laughs> They know when we're not, they know when we're just like, okay, I'm trying to be more spiritual. And they're like, right. Yeah, we'll see how that works. I will never forget, and I'm just going to just, I'm going to lay this out here, and I don't know what you want to do with it. Just do me a favor, don't tweet it. Um, it's a tweet-free zone for right now, for this moment. But I remember, like, I, I was early in my, in, in this whole thing of really just moving my faith forward, moving the dial a little bit closer to what Jesus looks like. And I'm sitting with my brothers and my dad, and this is the part you don't want to tweet, and we're having a beer, right? All of it, you know, we're just doing this thing, and, you know, we're sitting around talking, and we start going into this spiritual conversation. And my dad kind of pushes back from the table, and he says, we can't talk about God and drink beer at the same time. Like, why not? It's kind of working, you know? Kind of went there. It's Jesus made wine. I'm thinking, you know, I don't know why he didn't make beer, but I'm okay with it. Whatever. You know, it was just, yeah. And so what's, what's the next step for you? What's this next place for us to get to? Because in our families, you know, our families just present the biggest conflicts, right? Like, that was my dad telling me we can't have a spiritual conversation and have beer sitting on the table. You know, it's, it's my family, Love my dad, but he had that line drawn, right? And we had to work through that. We had to say, Dad, it's okay, it's okay. We don't have to, like, put the beer bottles down under the table or something, you know. Hide them and put them in paper bags or something so we can talk about Jesus. You know, it doesn't work that way, right? And, but that was my, that's my family. And I'm called first. I was called first to be a son and a brother, and you were called to be a daughter or a son in your families. And our families are just important things. And so we decided that as we move into this year, we're going to take a purposeful look at what it means to, to be family. Your family. What does it look like to make sure that family is one of the first things we think about when we think about doing things? And how do we take care of each other in family? And how do we as a church become a family? So that when you walk in here, it feels like home. I'm, I want to make sure that happens. Now, that, that's going to take us some time, right? We're going to work through that. And we're going to figure out what that looks like. Because for each one of us, it looks a little bit differently. But we're going to figure out what that looks like. And we talked about that last week and how we can make sure that family comes first in your family and in how we can support your family and how we can be family with each other. And, but, and I think if we do that, there's, then there's the next step. And, and this is progressive, by the way. It's really neat that the way God gave us this kind of new shift in who we are and in our vision for, for our church. And so he told us to focus in on family and make family the first thing we look at. And then secondly, he said, so once you get your family down, Pat, then you can start taking a look at your neighborhood and the community that we live in. Because I think it's, it's one of these things of concentric circles. So if you go with me for just a minute, you know, the center of the circle is my family, right? The middle of the circle is the tightest part of my circle are the people who I'm closest with and my family members. But, but God is not going to stop there in my life. He's going to, once I start working on that part, God's going to say, so what about the people around you in your neighborhood and your community in the larger area of Harrisburg? That's the next circle out. If you think of this like a bullseye, right? You know, middle circle, outer circle. And then there's the next circle we're going to talk about next week, and that's the mission, the greater mission field for us. So what does that look like? So let's zone in a little bit this morning on what the community looks like for us. Last week, family. This week, the larger community. Next week, we're going to talk about mission. And what does that community look like for us? What does that next concentric circle look like for you and me? And I want to pick a passage that I believe allows us to focus on what really God is talking to you and me about when it comes to that next circle out. And so I'm in First Chronicles chapter 4. If you've got a Bible with you, if you've got a Bible app, I promise I'm not going to think you're playing solitaire. It's okay. Go ahead and pull your smartphone out. Pull up the Bible app. If you don't have a Bible app, get one. 
Uh, we highly promote you version, you as in you, Y-O-U, version, Bible app, and it's, it, it gives you lots of different translations. You can carry the Bible with you in whatever device you have, and um, you can, it's easy to download. It's in the Play Store. It's in the Apple iTunes Store and all those places. You can just download um, the YouVersion app, and you can take the Bible with you. Like you're sitting in, at lunch, and you're like, oh, gosh, I know the pastor read something on Sunday. I wonder where that's at. And you can pull up the app, and you can find it, right? So it's just good. Um, it's part of our no excuses when it comes to reading the Bible. It's like you can carry the, you carry your phone everywhere. That means you carry the Bible everywhere if you have this app. So there you go. All right, we're going to be in First Chronicles. Now, you're like, First Chronicles, where's that at? Old Testament, right? It's way back in the Old Testament. So we're going to take a back. We're going, to, we're going to step back because I think there's something really powerful here that I don't want to miss in this passage that I believe God is saying to all of us today, that God wants us to hear because there's something foundational and, and key to what is happening in this story. Now, the story is surrounded by a genealogy. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the genealogy, the genealogy kind of, the brakes get put on on the genealogy, and the guy says this. Here's the, the writer. God is directing this writer of First Chronicles, and here's what he says. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. Wouldn't you love to have that in writing about you? Like, what if you're one of his brothers? Like, great. You know, mom is like, why can't you be more like Jabez? You know, you got to love that, right? His mother, it gets better. Here you go. Follow along. Here we go. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. Oh, great. Thanks, Mom. Like, I'm the constant reminder that when I came out, it hurt. Thanks. I mean, some of you were like, I could have named my child Jabez. Anyway. So, way to go. Um, Jabez, I wonder if he just had that long conversation with Mom at one point. Like, why did you name me Jabez? Because in Hebrew, Jabez comes from the root word pain. Thanks, Mom. You're, I mean, I have said to my kids, you're a pain, but I would never name them that, like permanently, right? Anyway, all right. I know I'm hitting a chord there. Anyway, verse 10. He was the one, listen to this, he was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. He was the one. The one guy, there's something that stands out about Jabez. Stop, put the brakes on all this genealogy. Let me tell you about this one guy. In the middle of all this, in the middle of all of Judah's descendants, there was this one guy I want to tell you about. There was something unique about him. He was more honorable than the rest of his brothers. He got the name Jabez because he came out, and it was painful for his mom, so she named him Jabez. That's who this guy is, and he's the one guy who prayed to the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. Listen, look at, look at this. And God granted him his request. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is interesting. This guy named Jabez just pops out in Scripture. This, this genealogy takes a halt. And, and let me point out this one guy in this family of Judah that you all need to hear about. That some, cause there is something unique happening here in this guy. And it looks kind of disjointed, but the reality is there's something powerful about Jabez that God wants us to know about. And God stops the message of the genealogy and says, No, there's this one guy, let me just tell you, in the middle of all. Have you ever done that? I mean, maybe you're just like me. You're just a little ADHD a little squirrel. Squirrel. Right. Jabez. Let me tell you about Jabez. I'll get back to the genealogy in a minute. Let me just tell you about Jabez. Here we go. Squirrel. It's, Jabez is the squirrel in the moment, but he doesn't want you to miss this. He's like, so there's this guy, and he does something nobody else does. He prays in such a way that God grants him his request. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome to say, okay, God, here's what I want, and God says, okay, sure, here you go. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, who is Jabez that God does this, right? What kind of individual is it? Well, he says he's a man who is more honorable than the rest of his brothers. So there's an honor to this guy, right? He's honorable. There's something about him. 
And the suggestion here is that this is a man who loves God, who is stepping in to a picture of who God is. And, and he must know God well enough to know what God wants because by praying what God wants, God is saying, okay, I'll give you what you want because it's what I want. All right? Have you ever had a child come to you and they ask you for something you've wanted to give them anyway? It's like, well, that's an easy one, right? That's a no-brainer. Let me give that to you because it's what I want to give you anyway. It's what I believe you need. And so I'll give that to you. Sure, you're, it's kind of like they're aligning with your thoughts. And so that's what's happening here. There's this alignment that Jabez has. And because of that, Jabez is living in this unique spot in his life, this unique place where he is, in effect, flourishing. And he's saying to God, Lord, do more of this. Can we do more of this? I want to I want to flourish, and I believe that God is causing this, this flourishing to happen. Uh, uh, so I, I, I want you to be clear on what I mean by that, by the, by the word flourish. It means that he's prospering, he's thriving, he's living an energized life. And he says, Lord, bless me so I can do more of that, so much so that my territory expands, that more people can find out about what's going on. So continue, Lord, to bless me in what I'm doing so that more people can know about it. Because here's what I believe, that God causes us to flourish. God blesses us so that he can bless others. Not so that we can keep it to ourselves. This isn't all about us, is it? I mean, as much as we would like it to be all about us, wouldn't it be great if it was all about us? Lord, just bless me just abundantly so I can sit in my house and just enjoy all my blessings. And God's like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. I'm going to give you because I'm expecting you to give it away to others. That's my expectation. That's God's expectation on our lives, right? And Jabez is stepping into this, and he is saying, Lord, so you've blessed me. Continue to bless me, Lord, so that I can expand my territory because I want what you want. I want everyone to find what I've found. I want everyone to flourish like I'm flourishing. God wants everyone to flourish. And Jabez knows that, right? Jabez understands what God wants because Jabez is living into it. And so Jabez is saying to God, look, I know what you want because you've given me what you want, so help me give it to others. Bless me and expand my territory so that other people can see what you want in their lives. Help me to figure that one out, Lord. Help me to do that, Lord. Help me to to make that happen in such a way that you have expanded my territory. Here's what's going on. This is a little backstory. Jabez is living in a really interesting time. First Chronicles is telling us about one of the things that happened in the history of the, of the nation of Israel. Now, by nation of Israel, I'm not talking about a geographical spot, that place we call Palestine, Israel today. I'm talking about the people called the nation of Israel. And, and what has happened to them is they've been in captivity over in Babylon. There's a lot going on, and it's like an entire soap opera if you read it. It's incredible and it's crazy, but they have been in captivity in Babylon. And at some point, the ruler of Babylon agrees to let some of the people go so they can come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, rebuild the city of God. And Jabez is one of them. And he's living in Jerusalem in this rebuilt understanding of what it means to be the people of Israel. And so he says, look, God, don't give us just Jerusalem. Give us the entire territory. Because you see, what Jabez knows is what we need to know. And that is this, that, that ultimately what God wants is that we don't just take our small home and our neighborhood, but we ask God to keep expanding our territory. Because it isn't about us alone. It's about how far God can reach out into the communities around us. And so Jabez is saying, Lord, don't help us. Don't, Don't have us just rebuild Jerusalem and then build walls and close the gates and we just keep you inside here. Because that's what could happen, right? Jabez sees that. He sees that the potential is that God is so good that we just keep him to ourselves. So Jabez says, Lord, bless us in such a way that we expand our territory out beyond the walls of Jerusalem, out into the community around us. 
And the way that Jabez does that is he says, so Lord, in doing so, I'm going to completely rely on you. I'm going to completely rely on what you've got in store for us. So Lord, just bless us, expand our territory, take care of, of evil and trouble and pain. Just give us the land. Because if we're going to flourish, the only way we're going to flourish is if we do what Jabez does, and that is that we just completely rely on God to make things happen. God, you show us which way to go. You, God, you, you show us what direction. That's what makes Jabez so amazing, I think, is he's this individual who's completely relying on what God wants, on what God is going to do. He's just going to step back, and he's like, if I'm flourishing, it's because I'm relying on God. I mean, this is a man people are going to follow. In, Second Chron- in First Chronicles chapter 2, it says that there's actually a town named Jabez. Named after this guy. Because he's such a leader. He's such an honorable individual. He wants so much. As, as the territory starts expanding, they name a town after him. Because they're like, this guy's got it. This guy's got this relationship. He's fully relying. Let's follow the guy who's fully relying on God. Because if he's flourishing and he's relying on God, maybe, just maybe the rest of us can flourish as well. Are you flourishing? Are you thriving? Do you feel like you're in a place where you're prospering? Maybe right now you're, you're feeling like things are going well. Things are good. And I get a chance to say hi to a bunch of you at the back door, like, hi, how you doing? Oh, things are good. That's a place of flourishing, of thriving. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure I'm thriving that much. Uh, Maybe you're in one of those valleys right now. Maybe you're in one of those transitional spots. Maybe you're in one of those moments where you're thinking, okay, I know it's coming, it's just not here yet. (laughs) Because you've been there before, and maybe this is just a trough, and you know that walking through a valley is the way to get to the next peak. Maybe you're in that spot. What I know here is God bless me and expand my territory is what Jabez prays in order to find where God wants them to go and do what God wants them to do. Because there's a community around us who is waiting to see you and your faith. So here's the driving question for this part of our vision. The driving question for this part of our vision is this. You ready? Ready? If this church disappeared tomorrow, I don't know how magically or mysteriously it could happen, but let's just say, go with me for a second, that all of a sudden this church no longer exists. And by no longer exists, I I don't mean just the building. I mean us. Because the building isn't really the church, right? You knew that, right? I'm not telling you something you don't know. The church is really made up of us. When you're not here, it's still a church building, but it's just not the same. It's kind of empty. So if the church disappeared, if the people stopped coming and the building disappeared and everything was gone and this was a barren ten and a half acre lot, here's the driving question for us in this part of the vision, community-centered. If we disappeared tomorrow, would the community miss us? Would the community around us drive by and go, oh, I really miss those guys, man. They were doing so much in our community. They were touching people. They were reaching people's lives. They were just transforming the whole community. You know, if it weren't for that church, this community would be, what, less than it is right now? I mean, it, that's got to be the mark for us as we take a look at this second step in our vision of being community-centered. That if people drove by and went, oh, I wonder what was there. Because there was nothing happening in their life based on what was going on here. Because you see, the danger that we have is the same danger that Jabez noticed in Jerusalem over almost 3,000 years ago. That we can become pretty self-centered when God starts blessing us. We can think, doesn't this feel good? This feels good. And we forget that in the middle of those blessings, God is saying, I'm giving you these blessings so that you can go give them to other people, first among us. We've got to make sure that we're taking care of each other here inside, or, or when we invite people in, they're coming into something that's 
shallow and empty. But secondly, then, we need to make sure that we have a passion for people who are not yet here. You see every empty seat? Every empty seat represents somebody who needs to know Jesus. Somebody who needs to be here. Maybe they're a member of your family. Maybe they're a member of your neighborhood. Maybe there's somebody you know at work who just, yeah, every time you see them, they're going off the rails or the, you know, the wheels are going off and their life is just a mess and you're thinking, man, if they could just hear this message today. And I think Jesus asks us to start praying the prayer of Jabez. Lord, bless me and expand our territory. Lord, bless us and expand our territory territory in the greater Harrisburg area. Help us to start reaching people who are far from you. What does it look like to start inviting people who are not yet here? People that you and I know. We know these people, right? What does it look like if we start inviting people to come and flourish, to come and be blessed by God and what God is doing, to come and be a part of the family and be a part of the com- community. Wouldn't it be great if, we were, if people knew that we were for them and we were standing for them and we were talking about them this morning in a positive way? Because here's what a lot of people think right now about the church. You know, what's interesting is Jabez is living in a land where most of the people don't believe in God, and I think we're back there in a lot of ways. And people drive by the church and say, well, I wonder what those people are for. Because we certainly know what we're against. Right? I mean, what gets popularized and what gets publicized is all the stuff we're against. But they, do they hear what we're for? That we're for them? That we're for our neighborhoods? That we're for our families? That we're for our communities? That we're for people who are the least, the last, the lost, the broken, and the disenfranchised. That we're for people who have much or have little. That we're for people who are newly here or have been here for generations and generations. Do do they know what we're for? Wouldn't it be great if people in this community knew what we were for instead of what we're against? Wouldn't it be great if people knew that there is a seat open for them and that we would love to have them here? I think one of the things that we've got to do this year is start focusing, not just on us, not just on our families, but on people who are not yet here. And to generate a passion for people who are lost and far from God, because I don't know how much more time we have. I just don't know how much time is left. When I read through this book, I know that I see signs that possibly the end is near. But I also know this. I've been around long enough to know that I have no idea how much time I have left. And I don't know how much time you have left. What I know is that I've known people who have been gone in an instant. I don't want to see anybody who will end up in a place that's not heaven. Because there is a hell. That's a real place. I don't want to see anybody there. I don't want to see anybody in a place that's absent of God and absent of his presence for an eternity. I don't want to see anybody who knows that there's a party happening in heaven and they can't go in. Because no one told them. Did you know that somewhere between 85 and 87% of the community that when they're polled says that when they're asked, if someone invited you to church, would you go? 80 to 80, 85 to 87% of our community says, yes, I'd, I'd go to a church if somebody invited me. Did you know that? You know what that means? That means we're not asking. You know, do you know that it means if we simply ask, if we simply said, if you, hey, you know, how about next week? I know you're going through something. And our church is addressing some issues in life, and, and we, just, we, we just talk about what this book says about how we should live our lives and how God can be there for us. Yeah, how about if you come with me next week? And I know it's scary. I know you mo- may not know most of the people, but you can sit with me, and I'll, I'll make sure you know the ropes, and I'll make sure you get a cup of coffee, and I'll make sure that it's going to be okay, and I'll sit with you, and then, you know, if you want, I'll talk with you afterwards about what you heard. I'll introduce you to the pastor. I'll let you know what's going on. 
Wouldn't it be great if we did more of that? Wouldn't it be great if we took this prayer and made it ours? So I'm I'm going to, John, would you do me a favor? Would you put verse 10 up on the screen for us? And can we just, how about if we read this together and make it our prayer for our community, for the territory right around us, for the people who don't know Jesus in our lives, for the people who, for whom these empty seats are here for them. Let's pray this prayer together. Let's speak it together. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Wow. Let's pray that prayer every single day. I want to challenge you to pray that prayer every single day to, to find First Chronicles chapter 4 and dog ear it in your Bible and just fold the page over and go there every day and say, okay, Lord, verse 10, I'm going to pray this. Lord, expand my territory. Bless me. Please be with me in all that I do. Keep me from all trouble and pain. Because I believe if we step into that place God is going to do something remarkable. Not because it's a church growth model. For God's sake, that's not what this is about. This is about people. Real people. Real lives. That we know. May God expand our territory this year. In Jesus' name, amen.